Okay. Hi, uh, this is Jason Gan. Uh, welcome to our talk. So today we are talking about putting OpenStack on Kubernetes. Um, 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 so we are three. We present together. Uh, this is Jason Gan from SK Telecom, and we have the Sungyu An uh, from the SK Telecom and Will uh, from Solinia. So what did happen today's talk? So I, I, I'll just give introduction about the background and our motivations. And then there will be uh, some more detailed explanation about how to set the Kubernetes and OpenStack together. Uh, then uh, we will uh, just uh, start demo. Demo is about actually deploying full OpenStack on Kubernetes and then uh, showing if one node fails, what happens. And after start demo, since it will take some time to deploy OpenStack, about seven or eight minutes, uh, we'll, we'll talk about our CI system, leveraging containers and Kubernetes all together. So let's start. So SKT is number one mobile service provider in Korea with 50% market share. And I mean, there's a bunch of stuff we are doing in telco area, especially in Korea. Um, recently, we just opened 4G LT 5 NCA with max 700 Mbps. So I think we are like a front runner uh, when deploying like a new network uh, infrastructure. Also recently, we are really focusing on AI and media. So uh, because of that, OpenStack becomes more important in our company to support not only network, but also media platforms or the AI uh, platforms and other IT services. And also SKT is very active in various open source um, community, including Open Compute Project and Telco Impra Project and Honest and SAP and OpenStack. And also the Solinia, uh, the company we are working with, uh, they are like a professional service partner that accelerate enterprise cloud adoption. I'm leading this through. And they're very technically agnostic. And they have uh, various clients with uh, Global Force 1000 organizations. And for the personal experience, the Solinia has very good uh, engineers and developers to work with. And before going into more detail, um, our work uh, is totally community effort. And we have like 11 uh, people uh, team, a small team. And uh, the will uh, provide a very good value to us. And to make our work uh, possible, we get lots of support and help from OpenTech Helm Project and Cola, and also the right contributing OpenStack operator working group. So uh, if you don't know about OpenStack Helium project, this is like a new project in OpenStack. Uh, it started by at and developers, and it's using a technology called the Helium to, pro to provision the containerized OpenStack on Kubernetes. So I, I think there is a bunch of talks throughout this summit about this Helium project. So if you are interested in uh, you can find uh, other uh, talks to, about this one. So what makes us to work on this Kubernetes stuff? The current or soon to be previous uh, way of doing OpenStack was that since as a telco, we don't have enough resources, enough, we don't have enough developers or engineers uh, to do our own OpenStack. So, we decided to work with vendors as usual. And that means vendor will provide OpenStack package and a way to do the configure management and deploy automation. And our job is to put the requirement and working with vendors to set up the deployment architectures and we have to purchase hardware and appliance. Um, and once we deploy OpenStack, then operation will happen in the collaboration between us and vendors. And in, in this way, uh, SKT just need to put a small number of very capable people working with vendors uh, to manage OpenStack services. Uh, but, so we considered 
building fail safe environment, I mean good open stack environment. We focused only in the deployment phase. But we realized that's not the answer, or that's not the like, effect to make a fail safe environment with OpenStack. So problems we had. Well, vendors provide very good way of automating deployment, but the, the upgrade is like a, no, what I can say about upgrade, that was like a very difficult. And even the, the updating the patch, a small patch, was very challenging for us. So without any way to apply patches uh, very easily and without interrupting any running services, uh, we have problem to apply most up-to-date security patches or the patches to solve our, uh, the problems in our environment. So that becomes uh, our operational problems. And also, in, in our company, we don't do like a single huge scale open stack, but we do lots of the small or medium scale open stacks. So, and we end up with having very siloed version or saying snowflake environment uh, with various vendors with various version of open stack in our company. And it becomes very challenging for us to manage those all the different open stack uh, in our company. So we wanted to have the better way to manage that. And also, um, we found out that uh, there is lack of flexible configuration management capability uh, from the vendors, uh, meaning that if our requirement uh, shoots their reference architecture, what they provide, we have no problem. But if our requirement is deeper, so we have to set up very differently from what they offer, then even if it is a small changes, it becomes a huge problem. So we really needed a more flexible way to configure to, to do more configuration based on our needs. And also, it was very difficult to integrate with our own stuff. So we have uh, our own team doing the SAP and all press based SAP appliance. And we have our own team to, to develop SDN control based on the honors uh, technologies. And we do have our data center operation platforms and our monitoring platforms. And sometimes interacting with the vendor package, uh, that was very difficult for us. It, it was very challenging uh, for us. So we really wanted to have solved these problems. And then, then we realized that not only focusing on the setting of requirements and setting up deployment architecture and uh, try to do the better operations, uh, we actually need to um, make our own configuration management tools and a better deployment automations and more flexible configuration and patch upgrade should be more easy and scale out should be more simple. And we realized that to do that, we need everything. So at the end, everything forms continuous loop to accomplish your fail safe environment like from active community involvement and doing the CI pipelines and setting up like a CD pipelines and deployment automations and like open state life cycle management, upgrade, update, rollbacks and everything that has to come all together. Otherwise, uh, it, it will be for, very difficult for us to solve this problem we are having. So we decide to look at the, some platforms to help that and we uh, choose that we used of Kubernetes and put OpenStack on Kubernetes. So what we're trying to do is we need to, we need to find a better way to deliver OpenStack and manage its life cycle. So we want to reduce the overhead, uh, like a dependency management, um, and one have each fast multiple deployment in standardized way, and upgrade, update, rollback should be easy, and easy scaling and healing. And uh, finally, we decided that we need some the underlying platform uh, to do the, those open source life cycle management uh, for us. So uh, that was Kubernetes. And key technology we are using is also Kubernetes for control plane orchestration and Helm for the application life cycle management automations on Kubernetes and CI CD pipelines leveraging Jenkins and OpenStack Helm project and Cola and Onos and SAP. 
that was our key technologies in, in, uh, for us to use and to develop this open stack on Kubernetes. And our plan, our goal is very uh, the big. So we don't want to do the red POC. And we want to do the production ready by end of 2017. And uh, we'll do the first production within 2017, targeting the, the private cloud in IT infrastructures. And uh, we will expand those to the more deployment, including media platforms and NFV deployment uh, based on OpenStack on the Kubernetes. And once we have those the very stable steam, steam line to provision OpenStack on Kubernetes, uh, we want to put more than OpenStack. We want to put other platforms, other apps on top of Kubernetes so we can have those Kubernetes as a, like a common underlying platform to deliver cloud apps. So that's our plans. And well, I put some diagram for the, our overall architectures, but I don't think we, I can have time to uh, describe everything in detail in this talk. So, I mean, we, we are happy to share uh, everything we are doing. Uh, so if you have more questions, you can contact us after talk, or we can, you can send the emails. So the upper one is our CI pipeline. Uh, we, 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 dis we thought uh, having like a very good CI pipeline is like a key uh, success point for us to uh, do this open stack on Kubernetes. So um, we used a bunch of community uh, upstream code, and we think of it our own repository, and trying to override uh, what we need to uh, set up. Uh, then we use Jenkins to, to set up like uh, the containers and Helm, which, which is automation code, and doing all the unit tests, and doing like uh, the integration test, and like, uh, promote and have a stable version of package. And it should happen automatically uh, via Jenkins. So uh, we, the, we have been putting mo most of our resources to set up these pipelines. Um, and then uh, we'll have this uh, the deployment in the, in the downside diagram, uh, saying that we want to put the OpenStack and Honors and Compute Node and Step Stories and some of network gateway on top of Kubernetes. Uh, so that's based over our architectures. And uh, for the specific demo system we are using today, uh, uh, the, there, will be, there is Jenkins, and Jenkins Slave has like uh, those kubectl and Helm CRI. And uh, through the Jenkins, we'll deploy OpenStack uh, on the Kubernetes work node. Uh, there will be a uh, three node configuration uh, for the controller and one compute node. And we are actually dynamically uh, pulling all the containers and Helm code from the, our repository. So from this moment, uh, Sung Yuan will describe more details about how we set uh, OpenStack and Kubernetes all together. So I'm going to uh, explain a little bit uh, Kubernetes and OpenStack. Uh, the first, let's talk about what would be targets for higher availability. Uh, starting from Kubernetes, first, the Kubernetes stores the necessary metadata in the key value store SCD. The SCD consists of three nodes in stable domain. And the Kubernetes API handles requests from external client or internal paths. And load balancer, as you know, is used to properly distribute the request and operate uh, very safe. And the scheduler is responsible for properly distributing the pod to the node. If it is configured as three, one of them will be elected as a master using the redirection. And the redirection method is the same as a controller manager. Uh, let's, talk, let's talk about the OpenStack. If you have built and run OpenStack, you know what parts of OpenStack you need to HA. The Among the OpenStack project, SK3, we are used Keystone, Glance, Nova, Cinder, and Neutron. Uh, the CPT is not used. It. The, like a Kubernetes, the OpenStack configure the HA mainly for the controller and the things API server first. 
The API is solved by load balancing multiple servers. All of the projects must have an API server and two or one more API server. Both Nova and Cinder have a scheduler, and these servers communicate with the queue so that they can be populated in multiple ways. MariaDB uses the Galera to configure the cluster and select the master through the column vote to synchronize. And RevitNQ uses the auto cluster plugin and uses the SCD as a backend for node configuration. Uh, neutral network node HA is uh, always the uh, most sticky one. And in SKT, we use the owner space to SDN controller called Zona to handle this problem. Onos is an open source software to build carrier grade SDN controller. I will describe more detail in the following slides. When you put OpenStack on Kubernetes, things will be a bit different. Since uh, Kubernetes natively has auto healing capability, you know, and we are the OpenStack on Kubernetes can be run without specifically configuring HA and regarding user VM availability. And Kubernetes will do it for you. That means the Kubernetes will automatically recognize a process failure in OpenStack control planes and we generate the container with that process to heal itself. That since running VM is not affected by a process failure in the control plane, a user will not notice any problem. Kubernetes are usually auto detecting node failure depending on the setting. By default, it could take up to five to six minutes. If we want to make sure our OpenTech API are also not interrupted from any possible failure, then you have to consider apply a specific HA setting the like a additional setting Galera cluster. It requires both specific content and Kubernetes configured for the proposed. Okay, I will the, the look at the each one in more details. This diagram shows how to deploy the Kubernetes in HA raid. The green color, kubelet, and flannel are displayed as a system process, and blue color control major and scheduler and API server, SCD, QPROX are executed as a part. The flannel is very simple to install, but there is an issue that network performance is degraded because the data is encapsulated in VXLAN to enable network communication between nodes. However, the, there is no big issues in network your performance because it is used for communication between control plane. Uh, there are several options of uh, Kubernetes networks, but uh, it has its own pros and cons. So uh, we are to decide to use the flannel, flannel issues for our the needs, uh, since we are only using it for network controllers. And so now we will take care of VM network. That's why we are using the, just the flannel network. You have to find out what type of Kubernetes network plugin is, a, is a good for your requirements. And we have another self uh, built in separately in Kubernetes. And self for a uh, self storage, the volume is created by utilized dynamically by using secret and storage classes. In order to easily build Kubernetes into multi master, you need to load the module as a part. It, this is uh, about the Kubernetes. The, in the absence of API server, Kubernetes takes charge of it. So Kubernetes is the, is the module that runs as the system the process in Node and manage Node information and creates and manage the part. Uh, in these options more detailed. The host override options can specify the name of the node. In this case, the Kubemaster 01. And you can also use the path manifest path option to specify the directory where the YAML file to create the path is located. For example, the SCD and API server, control major, scheduler, queue proxy is all created in YAML file and run as path. Service when created, it is registered in DNS. You can commit with the path using service IP. Specified IP of the DNS server to be created later 
or with the cluster DNS options. Mm. SED is a key value store with three cluster paths for stability. In this example, we cluster the three Kubernetes masters, uh, all information of Kubernetes such as node information and part information is stored in SED. Uh, the initial cluster option speci specifies the host IP, as you see, the, the, to configure the initial SED cluster. API server is used to store or call information in SD, so set the location of SD server. And also the important option here is the admission controller, which is covers many uh, policies. Uh, if the secret context deny value is included here, you cannot deploy demo set with a regular user account. For example, the Nova Compute, uh, Report, and Neutral Agent are specified as a demo set among open the components but they cannot be distributed. So this is, the admission control is very important. And since we are using Kubernetes only for managing open the process, which means the user will not access any container the, at all, and therefore we only ut utilize the authentication with token auth file, and that authorizes the such as rule-based access control. Furthermore, the, since enabling auth Authorization co uh, complicated our CI system to dynamically setting up Kubernetes and OpenStack. Uh, we decided to use authorization. Uh, in this specific cases, uh, using Kubernetes only for managing open tech processes simplify the wins over secu security. Yeah. And when uh, setting up as cluster, cluster manager and, and scheduler must select master server uh, through the leader election. The Kubernetes control major is a daemon that embeds the core control loops shipped with Kubernetes. The example of the controls that ship with Kubernetes today are the replication controller, endpoint controller, namespace controller, and so on, the which controller is created as a go routine. And the, the described in the previous slide, the schedule is also master as the leader election. Kube proxy is responsible for managing IP tables. So to handle IP tables, the, you must set the privilege value of the security context to true here and the red the characters and the cluster IP used by the service is a virtual IP. That is that the IP recognize the physical switch but the IP managed by t uh, IP tables through the cube proxy. To access the part from the host via service IP, you can access by specifying the IP CID and cluster CID options on the cube proxy. Uh, now let's talk about uh, how you deploy OpenStack on Kubernetes. Uh, you set every node as a Kubernetes worker, then label them uh, either as controller or compute. In this picture, we labeled four nodes as controller and others as compute. Then when uh, deploying through uh, Kubernetes, you can simplify the where to deploy through node selector. If you install OpenStack in the usual way, you will use three servers to configure the control node as HL and so on. So, for any stateless processes uh, with the replica settings, Kubernetes will take care of its failure with auto healing and managing, scaling out, and process. The, the keystone services, you just need to decide how uh, many of them you want to run, then let Kubernetes manage the rest of them. Though of course, you can always change how many of them you want to lead. In other words, you can increase or decrease the API server more easily in terms of the capabilities. So if you have four nodes labeled as a controller and the have a Kubernetes deployment with the three parts in the resource set, Kubernetes will deploy three Nova API or any open the process like here. And when a node fails, the Kubernetes will move part to another available node. Therefore, it always keeps the same number of the Nova API. I will show this uh, the, like a diagram, so how working in, in, the, in demo. 
So basically, we, uh, we use Galera cluster for MariaDB HA. The first time we create a job called MariaDB C, uh, uh, this job runs MariaDB Galera pod and does uh, initial setting to the configure Galera cluster. Then it runs another MariaDB Galera pod and dynamically configures and joins it into a cluster. So, so well, first the MariaDB seed and second the MariaDB 0, 1, 2 is a sequentially is one it will running. So once, once all three MariaDB paths are set up uh, successfully, MariaDB seed or uh, job finishes. So MariaDB, we can no more see the MariaDB seed the path. Since it requires to do dynamically joining a new node, it used the joiner. For example, when MariaDB2 is initialized, it's a, it's a third MariaDB, so it sees, uh, seems to three cluster addresses here, uh, like a, one is a seed and MariaDB0 and MariaDB1. The diagram show is now shown is one way to avoid problems if you have just only one physical network or port. So when you install the Neutron with the open tech ham, so you can you have to the some trick like this. The Neutron has a network interface to BREX OBS bridge to communicate with the external network. In the case the, the host can no longer communicate with that outside because the, the port is the uh, the using an OBS BREX. So the VR data at the top creates the RIMS bridge and the RIMS virtual interface in yellow color in advance. So after creating a pair of uh, virtual interface in advance, virtual Ethernet 1 adds an interface to the VR data bridge. And the other uh, virtual Ethernet uh, 0 is reserved for VR EX to add a port. So in this, like this, uh, you can then use one physical network port. This is the, uh, about the open tech ham neutron chart. The, the we are the override that the sum of the values. So upstream, which is updated quickly due to the content of the month ago. So may uh, have been slightly changed in content. Uh, even so, understanding the neutron chart will help you a lot. Uh, this is the SONA is an uh, implementation of open flow based neutron ML2 mechanism driver and L3 plugin with the open flow controller. The major features are the no agent, the no neutron agent is required, and no uh, BUM traffic, the ARP and DHCP request are handled by the controller, and west west traffic is handled at compute node, and the provide the load distribution or those south traffic and the step repairable gateway node. Uh, basically, SONA manages the virtual network state to receive the, from neutron via metal driver and set flow rules to OBS on computer and gateway nodes uh, based on the, the state. That indicate uh, any kind of data plane failure is uh, recoverable as, uh, as long as the controller is active. Um, the I will the, the if I, any chance I will the, talk about the sonar. Now I now I the distribute the ham chart and the distribute open stack on Kubernetes. I have uh, created one Jenkins job and it can be deployed at one time. I will run it and deploy may, deploy it takes maybe uh, eight minutes. So during the process, the wheel will continue to, to explain the CI. This uh, this is the our it, this is show the our Kubernetes that there is no open tech part. There I will create the. Sorry. I can see that. (laughs) 
I create the demo in our Kubernetes cluster. The, this job is just uh, it, uh, install the ham chart, the, and we are can see that like this, and we'll just keep going to the presentation. <coughs> All right, so that's going to take about 10 minutes to run. So in, in the meanwhile, I'm going to entertain you with our CI configuration. Um, so on the left here, we have Jenga. Uh, Jenga lives in your living room. It's probably less than an hour old. Um, otherwise, it would have been knocked down already. Um, on the right here, we have the, uh, the Lotte World Tower that just opened up in Seoul about a month ago. Uh, it's 123 stories, uh, half a kilometer tall. Um, it's, it's pretty impressive. During the, uh, when, when they opened it, they actually shot fireworks off the, off the sides of it. It was pretty, pretty neat. Um, why, why is this relevant? Um, I, I guess it's all kind of the, uh, the, the foundation metaphors. Um, so, so obviously you want to build a, a really strong foundation. And I think this is especially true when you're layering your virtualization like we are here. Uh, anytime you have something built directly on something else, you now have two somethings in there that breaks. Um, so that's, that's, that's sort of the takeaway there. Um, so it, it inherently something like this is going to be involve a lot of moving parts. Uh, so it's, it's kind of fun to actually like visualize those those numbers exactly. Um, so right now we have 34 local Git repositories, give or take. Uh, those are mostly internal projects and and wrappers that we use. Um, in addition to those, we have uh, 10 upstream repositories that we actively sync. Um, those eight of those are OpenStack projects. You know, Keystone, Neutron Nova, all that. Uh, they're pretty stable, consistent, um, not a lot of change. Uh, the other two are Cola, which is also fairly stable, and then there's OpenStack Helm, which just given the, its age um, is not what I would call stable. Um, it's actively developed. They fix stuff when it breaks, but it, it does break for sure. Um, so then uh, deployment configurations, profiles, the number of ways we deploy stuff. Right now it's four. Uh, that's going to get bigger in the future as we look to support Onos um, and other, other configurations there. Um, right now we have three hardware-based environments and one or more virtual environment at any given time. Um, so that's probably not going to change too much. Um, charts per deployment, 12. Um, that one's interesting because that's uh, the bare minimum of charts you need to deploy uh, bare bones open stack. So that's, that's no heat, that's no, no metering, no, no, nothing, nothing interesting. That's just like the bare bones stuff. So that's, that's 12 charts. Um, Docker images for every deployment, 23. Um, obviously, the deployment here is open stack deployment. Um, so th that's actually 23 images that we were building and maintaining to support that, that installation. Um, actually, 22, because we don't actually use the, the Cola Rabbit image right now. We're, we're still using the Mirantis one, I believe. Um, pods and jobs in a single deployment. One single OpenStack deployment is 34 pods and or jobs. I think the split is it's like uh, 10, 15 jobs, and the, and the rest are pods. Um, for, for the HA, it's almost, but not quite triple that, because you, obviously you're not going to just multiply everything by three. Um, there's going to be some jobs that are just going to be run once per, per clustered environment. Um, the, the other interesting thing is um, for, like, like for stuff like libvert, um, uh, one, one libvert is three pods. So that's, that's something when you think about it. It's you know pod per service. Uh, so you, you have that as well. Um, so what, what kind of workflows are we running? Uh, a workflow, by our definition, is one or more jobs and or physical activity interactions um, that are all chained together. Uh, so we, like I said, we, we build all our coal images. Um, 
on a good day, we're, we're in the green for both the Ubuntu and the CentOS ones. Um, uh, we build and test our own charts. Um, with the, the charts and the cola stuff, we try to track upstream as much as possible. Um, it's, uh, we would actually have many changes that we're interjecting just yet. It's, um, at least with the coal images, it's mostly just metadata, a um, couple, couple SK specifics, uh, repos, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, we have testing workflows, obviously, you know, test things. Um, and we have our upgrade and deployment workflows as well. Um, how am I doing on time? When did you start? All right. Um, so, kinds of jobs. Um, so th those uh, workflows would then reference the uh, the various commits, um, and that, that's obviously going to be your your basic validations for any sort of changes that you're pushing. Um, there's going to be live system deploys, which is going to test the update functionality. Uh, our nightly builds are mostly just a. Uh, CI system validation, um, as well as you know, catch, catch anything. Oops, catch anything that um, yeah might have slipped through the cracks there. Um, and we we have a nightly rebuild as well, so we can get the clean slate. Um, and additionally, we try to vet out the upstream builds before we merge them. That's not always the case, and that's something we need to work on. Um, but it's something we try to do anyway. And um, yeah, so that's, uh, interestingly enough, the, the, the single biggest problem we've had recurring has been the, um, the, the Docker storage drivers conflicting with Kubernetes config maps, and they either deadlock or they, they do really bad things. But if, if you look at the, uh, the, the Jenga picture we had, that'd be like, the second block up on the uh, on the uh, architecture there. So when, once that falls down, everything else kind of goes tumbling over it. Um, uh, we started out using CentOS 7 with a 310 kernel on top of uh, XFS with the overlay driver. Probably the worst possible combination. We've tried a bunch of other stuff, and uh, it, it's better now. Um, so nothing here is specific to this project. It's just generally good good um, DevOpsy CI stuff. Um, people underestimate the, the, like how much a fork costs. So you should really not fork unless you're willing to accept the commitment of, of a full-time project. Um, isolate all your builds. That was uh, an, another, another big one that we, we hit. Um, we, we naively tried to run everything where we deployed it and discovered that you cannot run more than one instance of OpenStack on a Kubernetes cluster without special attention, which we were not giving it. So eh, it's, it's best to keep those builds isolated. Um, incremental upgrades don't change one thing more than once. And I know this, you know this, and I'm saying it once again because I'm going to screw this up. Um, like, like, like the morning when I decided that we should upgrade to Kubernetes 1.6, use RBAC and upgrade to etcd3. That was not a good day. Um, it didn't work, by the way. Uh, I, all those things individually work, but with our, yeah, our system, not so much. And just uh, re rebuilding all the time. You can never rebuild more than, more, more than you need to, for sure. Um, so just a quick, quick testing on, on um, what, what we test, how we test it. Um, we're, we're trying to look at the Kubernetes end-to-end -end stuff. Um, obviously, if Kubernetes isn't working, then nothing else is going to work. So you want to make sure that's stable. Um, Keepster is not a test. I get it. Uh, that said, we do use it to validate things. And we have uh, our own custom scripts there. Um, for, for the cold container builds, we, we inject some BATS tests just to validate users, processes, uh, executables. And then, then we also use Claire for the, the static testing analysis. And that's. Um, Claire's a nice idea, but the actual value, I would argue, is minimal. But that's, I, I could explain that later if anybody cares to argue. Um, testing. So Helm, Helm has this wonderful command called Helm test. Uh, it's a little bit rudimentary, 
but it, it will allow you to actually execute tests. Um, this is especially important uh, in the case of um, if you're doing OpenStack Helm and Cola because OpenStack Helm injects all of its configurations. So you can't actually really test a Cola container in, in, its, in, a, in, a, in a vacuum there. Um, a lot of stuff has their own built-in tests like Horizon, so that makes it super easy there. And ultimately, once everything stood up, then you got your full Tempest runs and uh, Rally as well for validations. And, and once stuff is actually successfully deployed, you know it works. I, there, there's still more stuff that has to happen there. Um, just as far as, you know, does it work? Can you log in and click? And is the user experience there? Um, is it performant enough? Um, all that stuff. And then the, the, the failure testing is actually kind of the interesting part because when, once, once you have the, the double stack there, it's, uh, um, the, the, the failure cases is like almost exponentially bigger just due to the fact that stuff can fail on a physical or on a virtual level. You have multiple networks. Um, you got, it's, it's, it's even better than you know, triple O because you actually have the, the different uh, virtualization technologies there. So the rules definitely change um, as far as like how, how you test how stuff breaks. Um, and ultimately kind of the, uh, you know, the end goal is here is to make upgrades as boring as possible. Um, once again, you know, this, this is just DevOps stuff, you know, test, test, test. Uh, in this case, you can make testing a lot easier. So that, that should have been about 10 minutes, hopefully. No. The update is already running. The, uh, maybe it takes the, uh, six minutes, so, so we are already uh, spent uh, 11 minutes. And now I'm the the, the create the VMs. So makes. Okay. You can see that. Okay. This is the, the we are creating the VMs before we VMs we setting the router or any script like this, and we are now we are. Due to the time limit, I mean, yeah. we are not going to show uh, when we failed one node what happens, but uh, okay. uh, the, the process authority will uh, be created. So just uh, summing up, uh, but still we have lots of challenges in here. Um, there is like operation burden. You have to do the Kubernetes and OpenStack. And uh, OpenStack is not cloud native app, so there will be lots of customized way to, you have to do on the Kubernetes. Uh, that should still be the problem for the operation and the, the making this uh, technology better. Uh, so we probably need to discuss how we can make OpenStack more uh, feature cloud native way. I, I know there is uh, some uh, discussion going on on that part. And also we need to uh, very focusing on Kubernetes stability and the security problem. So uh, there, are, there are lots of challenges we have to uh, overcome, but we believe this is a very feasible technology we can put on our production. So this is the end of our the slide, the presentation, and thank you. And if you have any question, you can come uh, to us. Thank you.